Hey guys, it's Brandon Adams, the host of Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Before we start our show today, just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of you who were able to come out to the Marlows in Brookhaven last night for our Dog Nation Invasion Big Game Preview. Looking ahead to the game against Florida on Saturday, it was a lot of fun. It's nice to see so many other Gator haters out there just like me. And by the way, still wearing that Gator hater t-shirt here today. We got a fun show for you. David Green later on, Mike Johnson here as well, and a whole bunch of talk about how the dogs are going to beat the Gators on Saturday. It's going to be fun. We're glad you're with us. Dog Nation Daily begins right now. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. You know that there has been trash talk in the uh, lead-up to the Georgia-Florida game on Saturday. It has been coming from the Florida side here. But yesterday, the Georgia players got a chance to respond to that, and I thought the response was pretty much perfect and very much in keeping with what you would expect from Georgia this season. I'll explain why here, but for those of you who may not be fully plugged in to exactly what's been going on, let me give you a little background here. Let me start with Florida wide receiver Josh Hammond, who when he met with the media this week was talking about the mindset of his team, and he's thinking about the fact that none of the Florida seniors have ever lost to Georgia. And, well, that fact that they've had this winning streak against the Dogs apparently gives Hammond and some other Florida players a whole bunch of confidence. Here's what he said. That mentality that they bring, being that they've never lost to Georgia, definitely brings a lot of confidence to us just knowing that Georgia isn't a team that we lose to. So I think that's the message in the locker room right now that, you know, they might be the number three team in the country, but they, they can't beat Florida. I think most people, not just Georgia fans, but objective observers would say it's one thing to have confidence in your team. It's another thing. To, it's, it's a far different thing to say the team on the other side of the field can't beat you, especially when you're three and three, and that team is the number three overall team in the country. A lot of people kind of looked pretty cross at what Hammond had to say. Not only Hammond, though, also Chauncey Gardner here as well, who, when evaluating Jake Fromm, kind of made Fromm seem like sort of a simplistic game manager as opposed to the quarterback who's leading the SEC right now in yards per attempt and been fabulous on throws deep down the field. Here is uh, Gardner, for those who may have forgotten. I mean, he has a great quarterback. I mean, I get it. He's throwing simple passes. I get it. Anybody can throw a slant. I get it. But, I mean, like I said, we're just playing football. He's, if he's one of the best quarterbacks, like I said, so be it. But he has to play Saturday. We're going to see what his best attribute is. If, if he can be as with his arm, what do he do? But like, we're not focused on what he can do, what he can't do. We're just going to go out there and focus on us and just play football. We've been doing, like I said, the past three to four weeks. Yeah, so listen, once again, it's one thing to have confidence in your in your defense. It's a far different thing to say the quarterback that you're going against is a simple guy who's doing the kinds of things that any uh, quarterback's going to be able to do. That feels like the kind of thing that a, a lot of folks are going to have a problem with and it's going to be described as trash talk by many people, including the reporters that gathered around with the Georgia players uh, yesterday, one of them safety J.R. Reed. And while Reed may not be a guy that's been on this Georgia team for very long, he certainly apparently is aware of the Florida reputation. Because what Reed said yesterday when I asked about this stuff from Florida is, listen, this just comes with the territory when you're talking about the uh, Gators. Here's a pretty funny exchange that Reed had with some media members. How do you look at that type of behavior? Uh, I, guess, I mean, that's Florida, so uh, I mean, that's what you expect for some teams. Some teams you don't expect it, but... It doesn't bother me that much. You do expect it from Florida? No, I just <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's just trash talk. It's no big deal. So I love how uh, Reed kind of catches himself there at the end because the follow-up from the reporter is, wait, so you do expect Florida to say this kind of stuff? And Reed doesn't want to give bulletin board material of his own, so he kind of deflects away and says, no, this is just trash talk. But the fact of the matter is, while Reed is going to be too classy to say this, here on Dog Nation Daily, I'm, I'm not going to be too classy to say this. This, to a degree, is what you've come to expect from Florida. And this, to a degree, is what Florida's kind of been doing over and over again uh, for many years. And, and Reed's statement, even though he's going to kind of walk it back to kind of stay within the boundaries of where Kirby Smart wants his team to be, what he says to begin with is right, that yes, this does come with the territory when you talk about the Florida Gators. However, uh, the wise Georgia senior Lorenzo Carter also reminds us that it's not just you know Georgia Florida where this kind of stuff goes on and it's not just the Gators who are guilty of this kind of thing I mean after all the cocktail party is a rivalry and this is the kind of talk you get in rivalry games change but for Georgia fans already thinking about the next big road game all right well we'll hear from Lorenzo Carter here it's a rivalry you don't expect anything less there's going to be a lot of trash talking out on the field too but 
as long as we just keep going out there and playing football the way we've been playing, play physical and fast, I mean, all that stuff is going to take care of itself. Obviously, in the substance of what Carter says there, he's absolutely right that Georgia doesn't have to worry about uh, what Florida's saying. But there is an element of what Florida's saying that sort of does sort of go beyond the boundaries of what you would expect from typical rivalries and does sort of fit in the pattern of some of the things that Florida's kind of done in the recent past. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Think back to last year's game against Tennessee when you had Quincy Wilson and Jalen Tabor, the two Florida defensive backs, saying everything that they said about the uh, Vols. Wilson even going so far as to say that you've never seen a duck pull a truck and insinuating that you've never seen the uh, Vols beat uh, Florida after all it had been since 2004 that Tennessee had won in that series. Not to be outdone by that was Mark Thompson, the Florida running back, who going into the game against Michigan at the start of this season said he couldn't wait to see his team, the Gators, beat the brakes off the Wolverines from Michigan. And it's not just Florida players here. It's also the uh, Florida program who had kind of the audacity to schedule LSU for homecoming as sort of a show of institutional trash talk after the bad blood that spilled from the uh, cancellation of the game last year between the uh, Tigers and Gainesville. Florida thought they would kind of get the best of uh, LSU by scheduling the game for homecoming. Uh, One of Florida's leaders, the uh, offensive lineman Martez Ivey, admitted during SEC media days that, yes, uh, LSU would probably take that as a sign of disrespect. But here's the thing about those three instances of recent trash talk from Florida and why it maybe has some relevance for the game for Georgia on Saturday uh, against the Gators. The Tennessee game where Tabor and Wilson were talking, the Michigan game where Mark Thompson was talking, the silliness of scheduling LSU for homecoming this year, all three of those games ended up being Florida losses. Think about Tennessee last year, who, you know, had a hard time in a lot of games and yet in the second half is moving the football with regularity against the very defensive backs who were talking trash about the Vols last season. The only team that Michigan has looked good against virtually all year long has been Florida, and that's the team that Mark Thompson said his team was going to beat the brakes off of. Obviously, that didn't even come close to happening, which is to say nothing of the LSU game from a couple of weeks ago. And then there's also this, you know, the two guys talking trash about Georgia here this week, Chauncey Gardner, according to the uh, Twitter feed CFB film room, Gardner's got 14 missed tackles this season and the worst uh, tackling rate in the entire SEC. And I kid you not, when I searched Chauncey Gardner's name this morning to kind of do a little research and get ready for the show, Google actually suggested once I typed Gardner's name in, missed tackles. I'm not kidding about that. That's what that's what Google thinks about when it when you mention the name Chauncey Gardner, that's one of the guys talking trash about Georgia this week. Also, Hammond, the receiver, I mean, he's failed to record a catch in three of the games that uh, Florida's played so far this season. I mean, what this sort of speaks to to me is an element in which Florida kind of thinks of itself as sort of a, a, a schoolyard bully as a program. But in modern times and recent days, it's sort of been relegated more to a rodeo clown, the kind of, uh, the, the kind of program that sort of puts off on a false, phony bravado but generates more laughs than actual intimidation or fear. I mean, I can promise you this, Georgia's not scared in the least bit about Florida on Saturday, regardless of what Gardner and Hammond say. Now, the uh, player's going to be too classy to mention that when they when they speak to the media, but one more clip from Lorenzo Carter lets us know that, for the most part, this just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Here's uh, Carter one more time. That's what it does. That's what bulletin board material is. I mean, it's just a little extra fire, but, I mean, we don't need that. Uh, we have enough fire and intrinsic motivation like uh, with the team that anything else outside is noise that we block out i mean i think there's an element of what he says there that's actually uh pretty interesting you know a lot of fans reached out to me on uh twitter when the gardner and hammond stuff first came out and they're saying good this is exactly what georgia needs to get ready for this game and i, I guess i was kind of right there with uh dog fans and thinking that this was kind of a perfect recipe for georgia to do what it needed to do against florida But Carter takes it a step further and saying, no, we're so focused, we're so locked in right now that we don't even need this. We don't need the extra motivation for Florida because we're motivated enough on our own to be the best we can be and to correct the the record in this rivalry and to to, to give the folks who've never gotten a win over Florida currently in this locker room, to give them a chance to uh, do that. And it's worth pointing out here also that when it comes to disregarding the trash talk, Lorenzo Carter apparently doing that with the Florida game, but didn't necessarily do that with Mississippi State. Remember when Jonathan Abram talked about beating the brakes off of Georgia? I mean, Carter sort of showed some visible, I don't want to say he was bothered by it, but he certainly seemed to be at least irritated by it. Did not give the uh, media members a whole lot when he was asked about it, essentially saying he had no relationship with Abram anymore and didn't want to talk anymore about it. 
I mean, that's a level of, of, of concern and irritation about Mississippi State that Carter doesn't seem to have for uh, Florida, which leads me to believe this team is locked in. And no matter what Florida may try to do with mind games and no matter what Florida may try to do to uh, get Georgia off its game, this is not a Georgia team that's easily moved off its goals, off its focus. The phrase all year long has been to keep chopping wood, and my guess is Georgia goes to Jacksonville on Saturday ready to chop a whole lot more wood. My name is Brandon Adams. This is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It is good to have you with us. Whether you're watching us on Facebook Live, of course, we're there for you at 10 a.m. each and every Monday through Friday on the Dog Nation Facebook page. We're also available for you as well on the radio at Athens Sports Radio 960. The ref, we're at noon every day on 960 The Ref. Always uh, good to be with the folks in the uh, Classic City. And good to have you with us on the uh, podcast here today as well. Whether you listen when we post the show at the WorldFamousDogNation.com or on iTunes, pretty much wherever podcasts are found, you can find Dog Nation Daily. And last night we're at the Marlowe's in Brookhaven, and someone was saying to me, hey, you guys got to show a little more love to the Android users. So at a certain point in time, we are going to need to do that. We're going to need to to show a little more love to the Android users. I guess we're not currently on Google Play right now. That's something we probably need to make sure we do. We'll talk to some of the folks who help us every day with that, and we'll make sure we get Dog Nation daily on Google Play to make the show a little easier for Android users to find. Because, listen, we say it all the time, we want Dog Nation daily to be uh, something folks can get to and, uh, and, and get to pretty easily. And, by the way, I hope you're able to get to Jacksonville on Saturday as well. We're going to be there for our Dog Nation invasion tailgate. Had a great time talking to the folks at Marlowe's about this last night. We were able to give away some of these red Dog Nation daily Gatorator T-shirts last night. We'll do a whole lot more with you this Saturday. It starts at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be right there in the uh, touchdown lot. Uh, it's right near Bryant Street off Gate 6. Uh, we'll tell you more about that. We'll have our Dixie Vodka tasting bar there for those who are older than 21. We'll have four televisions set up. Jeff Sintel and I watching the early games with you. And we'll have While Supplies Last. And these things were going hot and quick last night. But While Supplies Last, we'll have the brand new uh, Dog Nation Daily Gator Hater T-shirts to uh, give away as well. So make sure you get there. This is all courtesy of our sponsors, and one of which is, of course, R.S. Andrews. And Right now, it's cold this morning when I woke up. That means you've got to be thinking about making sure that furnace is working the way it needs to be working this winter. That's why you want to make sure you get the $99 guaranteed furnace tune-up from my friends at RS Andrews. They're clean, screened, trained, and timely techs will give your th- system a thorough check and make sure it's working all winter long. Trust the ones I trust. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. And by the way, speaking of the Marlowe's in Brookhaven, uh, Marlowe's also one of the great sponsors for our Dog Nation Invasion to Jacksonville here this weekend. Thanks so much for those of you who are able to come out to uh, Marlowe's last night in Brookhaven. That was a great time. Always great to see uh, dog fans out there and everyone dressed in their red and black. A lot of Gator Hater t-shirts in the room last night. That was a really cool thing to see. we got a busy show coming up for you. We're going to have David Green a little bit later on. We'll have uh, my partner from AT&T SEC Company Live, Mike Johnson, also on the program here as well. We'll do that coming up in a couple of minutes. But before we get to any of that, you know, I've been doing this every day uh, on the program leading up to the game against Florida. You all know I'm a big Gator hater, and uh, I've sort of given the opportunity for other people to show how big of a Gator hater they are as well. We've been calling it our Gator hater roll call. People have been reaching out to me on social media, at Dog Nation Daily. We'll hit a few of these here today. Uh, we don't have time to do them all today. We're really behind on this. Over the next few days, we'll do a whole bunch of these. Uh, we'll do that. We'll do that here today. Um, we, uh, but we'll, we'll get as many as, as we can here today, including Brett Mullen here on Twitter, who shows some pictures of him from the 2012 Georgia-Florida game, celebrating that victory that put Georgia back in the SEC championship game. And uh, 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 Sanders Cummings there getting a little bit of celebration. Here's Xavier Cottle, who gives us a, uh, a Gator hater here in Alexandria, Virginia, checking in all the way up there with a terrific picture of a dog punching a Gator in the face. And, of course, metaphorically speaking, looking forward to seeing Georgia hit Florida in the mouth all day long on Saturday. We'll hit a couple more of these. I like this from Julie Craig, who shows a Georgia player, you know, dominating a Florida player on the ground saying, say, uncle, and maybe Georgia will get a chance to watch Florida tap out and submit on the uh, field on Saturday. Uh, good to see Brooks Lusk with us last night. At the uh, Marlowe's in uh, uh, Brookhaven, he's. if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you see him wearing his brand-new red Gator Hater T-shirt. Brooks, we appreciate you sharing that and appreciate you uh, being out with us last night. I like this one from William on Twitter. He's at GTKiller82. He, uh, I guess, met Isaiah McKenzie at the UGA Bookstore. We do our Dixie Vodka postgame show each and every day. And uh, William got his autograph with Isaiah McKenzie while he was wearing his Dog Nation Daily Gator Hater T-shirt. That was a really nice thing to see from uh, William. Good stuff. Our buddy Bass and Dog also showing off those red Gatorator T-shirts. And, listen, I love seeing those things on uh, Twitter. Tyler Herring was with us last night. 
He was also showing his uh, Gator Hater T-shirt off. Make sure you share those on social, social media. Let everybody know that we've got those for you right there, the uh, Gator Hater T-shirts, and uh, we'll be giving them away on Saturday. And a lot of you have been asking about buying them because of our sponsors. We don't have to sell them. We're able to give them away. So I hope you'll see us on Saturday to be able to do uh, just that. It is great to have you this here on Dog Nation Daily. As I said, fun show coming up here today. David Green, the former Georgia quarterback, later on. We'll talk to him about the uh, game against Florida and kind of everything about this rivalry, what it feels like to him to uh, renew this series once again. That's coming up later on. For now, though, let's get ready to welcome in Mike Johnson, my terrific partner in AT&T SEC Country Live each and every afternoon. Really interesting stuff from him on his perspective on this rivalry as an outsider and kind of uh, where Georgia goes from here, assuming it's able to get the win against the Gators on Saturday. So it's great to have you with us on Dog Nation Daily. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And I will say hello to my partner from AT&T SEC Country Live, uh, Mike Johnson, of course, every Monday through Thursday on the SEC Country Facebook page at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And, uh, Mike, first of all, welcome back to the program. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just uh, getting ready to see those uh, those Gators match up with those Bulldogs this weekend. Yeah, it's definitely the marquee matchup in the SEC this weekend, given the fact that you've got LSU, Auburn, Alabama, three pretty big SEC teams going to take the, the week off and in the case of Alabama and LSU in preparation for their matchup next week. So Georgia and Florida can have the stage themselves at least a little bit. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of made it more interesting, I think, for some people is what I would describe as trash talk kind of coming from the Florida side this week. I mean, as a former player yourself, I mean, what is your thought about a team that maybe tries to use this as motivation, tries to try to use the, the, the bravado towards the media as a way to get their own team fired up? Is all fair and love in football, and is this a, a, a tactic that you don't have a problem with Florida using, or do you take more of the old-school approach of, hey, how about you let your, you know, your game do the talking for you on the field? Well, it's definitely something, you know, we didn't deal with much at Alabama because by the time uh, we were able to trash talk, we were, uh, you know, I was headed out the door. We didn't really win until the end of my career when Nick Saban got there. And so it, it definitely is a different approach. I, I think you have to look at what Florida has been and what they have been this year and understand, um, you know, that's just that, that's something Florida's been able to do under Jim Mappoy. They, they have talked a lot of trash. And the last couple of years, they have been able to back it up and just not so much this year. And so I think they're trying to find any edge possible, and I think the players are still reacting in the same way they have been uh, when they were a good program. It's just the the product hasn't been there on the field, so it makes a, uh, it look a little bit different this year when you when you kind of uh, start to look into some of the things they're saying. Um, I, I am old school approach in the fact that I think it definitely has to play out on the field. Nothing you say coming out of your mouth during the week is going to affect anything I'm trying to do to you on the weekend on Saturday. So, I would imagine that that's the thought process going through Kirby's mind, going through the Bulldogs' mind right now is that, hey, you know what, you can talk all you want to, but we, we've done some good things this year. They feel like they've turned a corner, and uh, it's going to be a battle all day for Florida. I can only imagine what's going to happen uh, down there in Jacksonville this weekend. Maybe this is me just seeing Georgia in the more favorable light here, but I really like the Georgia response to a lot of this in that, you know, maybe privately behind closed doors, we're hearing some things about, you know, what Georgia's doing for its own level of motivation in this game, but publicly not going to play ball with Gardner or Hammond on any of this kind of stuff, not going to kind of get into the to the drama that goes along here. This just sort of fits into what Georgia's done this season, which is find a way to stay hungry, but staying hungry without sort of veering beyond the, you know, the, the humility that's necessary to kind of stay focused on a season. You know, you've heard from some Georgia players yesterday, like J.R.E., like Lorenzo Carter, and they seem to be saying exactly what, what a Kirby Smart-led team would want its players to say. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And, and you know, Kirby Smart obviously has been in and around that locker room over there with Nick Saban, and you see the same thing coming from them. It's, it's hey, we don't really talk trash. It's kind of, uh, you know, let's, let's see who can play for 60 minutes. And, and that's really, you know, that, that's the deciding factor in terms of who has bragging rights for the next year. And uh, you know, I get it, too. I mean, Kirby's been in and around that program. He knows, uh, you know, kind of the shtick when it comes to this game this weekend in Jacksonville. He's, you know, he's he's played in this game. He's seen this game play out, and he knows how big of a win this would be for Georgia to kind of get over the hump. And, and you know, I, the other day I was talking about it between me and you, and I went back to kind of, uh, you know, my junior year in 2008 with Alabama. We, we had to play teams like LSU and teams that we had not been able to get over the hump with recently to really establish yeah. ourselves as, hey, maybe we deserve to be number one, number two, or number three in the country. And I think getting over that hunt will be a big deal for Georgia this weekend. Go in there, 
deal with business, treat it like a business trip, and pull it out. Don't worry about what anybody else is saying. And uh, I can imagine that's the message that Kirby Smart is delivering right now. So you know the drill here on this show. Obviously, our listeners and viewers want to hear about how much Georgia is going to stomp Florida on Saturday and how bad Florida is. That's like the red meat to the audience we have for this show. But it's probably appropriate to spend a minute at least looking at the flip side of that. I mean, is Florida, in your estimation, a good enough team to keep it close with Georgia on Saturday? And maybe let me set you up a little differently here. If the game is close, what could Florida do to make that happen? Well, listen, I, I don't know that, you know, X and O's wise, if you're talking about down in and down out, I don't think that these teams are anywhere in the same ballpark. But I think when you talk about explosiveness in their playmakers, I think when you see a healthy Tyree Cleveland, when you see Kadarius Tony, Malik Davis, you look at some of the things they do have, some of the weapons they do have offensively, you know, you could see that Georgia, you know, possibly a blown assignment here or missed gap coverage there, and all of a sudden Florida's got a couple of touchdowns on the board. They, they have talent. I, I mean, you don't see it all the time for the offensive line or from the quarterback position, but they have talent. And, and they're a defense that's kind of coming around here recently. I love the, some of the things that Taven Bryan's done on the defensive line. They will try to rush the passer and try to get Georgia in some of these long passing down situations. Uh, but it's going to be hard to stop that run up front. It, you know, if you're Florida coming to this game, you haven't done what you wanted to defensively this year. It's going to be hard to stop Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle and the rest of that running back core in the early downs and get them in those long passing situations. So, I think they have to take their shots offensively when they can. I think if you're Florida right now, you're probably hoping for a special teams touchdown at some point in this game and try to create turnovers. Use those ball hawks you have back there in that secondary like you did against Michigan and some of the other games this year to uh, create some turnovers. Get Jake Fromm in long down situations and make him make bad decisions. I think that's the only really path to victory you can kind of construct if you're Florida right now because down in and down on X's and O's wise, Georgia has the better players. If you're just going to line up, and ask Georgia's offensive line to go against their defensive line, you, you know, Georgia's going to win most of those battles. So you have to find some of those, uh, you know, lightning in a bottle type of plays where, hey, maybe you rip off 70 yards, 80 yards, and find yourself in the end zone and uh, keep the game closed into the fourth quarter and hope for some turnovers. You mentioned Fromm a moment ago, and that was obviously the source of the Chauncey Gardner trash talk from earlier in the week. And I want to go on the record of saying this right now, and I feel like I've said this now a couple of times maybe to you in different you know, formats, different venues, maybe on AT&T, SEC Country Live. Georgia may lose a game at some point this season, and in the worst-case scenario could even lose on Saturday. I'm a big believer that if and maybe when Georgia does lose a game this year, I don't believe Jake Fromm is going to be the reason why. Now, I don't know why Georgia's going to lose when it does lose, but I have enough confidence in Fromm right now to say that he won't be the reason. Which is not to say, Mike, that I believe he's going to be turnover free. I don't, I don't expect him to be. But Fromm does a lot more good than he does bad right now. And if there's a bad moment for Georgia this season, I don't think it's going to come from Fromm. Uh, would you agree with that? Or is, is there a, a degree to which you think I could be wrong? Well, I, I 100% agree with you, uh, first of all. I, you know, and I think in a roundabout way, you can make the argument that maybe it is a roundabout version coming from Fromm. Maybe they don't try to do some things with him early in the year. Maybe uh, they don't trust him to do some of those things later in the year because you and I have talked uh, a ton about Jalen Hurts over at Alabama and the fact that, listen, it's not so much about what he you know doesn't do. He doesn't pass for a ton of yardage, but he also doesn't throw interceptions and turn the ball over. And I think that a lot of people had the knack to look back at Alabama season last year and say, oh, Jalen Hurts couldn't win the game against Clemson. When, in fact, Jalen Hurts was doing the same things all year long. It was the Alabama defense that lost the game against Clemson. So I definitely see where you're coming from. I, I think if there's breakdowns, I don't think you know, you're know you looking at Jake Fromm as a guy who's going to throw into traffic or make crazy throws or try to pull with Brett Favre and, 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 and throw downfield on the run. But so far we haven't seen how he reacted in those situations. So I, I definitely think it will be interesting once they find themselves in a close game and the running game's not working. Uh, to be able to kind of put that on Jake Fromm's shoulders and ask him to go downfield in those situations that aren't quite favorable. But, um, you know, right now I don't see it. Unless they get in really like a, one of these games passing-wise that, you know, 300, 350 yards on both sides of the ball and somebody tries to expose Jordan's secondary, then I'm with you. I don't think it's going to be on Jake Fromm's shoulders so much. I think that you're going to point to some of the other things that didn't work throughout the year, like the running game or the, or the front seven, and say, you know what, that's probably the reason we lost this one. We did a lot yesterday on both shows, SEC Country Live and Dog Nation Daily, on the Jim McElwain death threats and the suspicion about the veracity of those claims. We don't have to get back into that here today. But what about the idea of just the criticism from you know Florida people about McElwain as, as it is, apart from that? I saw a tweet from Edgar Thompson, who covers Florida for the Orlando Sentinel, of you know some frat house in Florida that's got some you know fire Doug Nussmeyer sign hanging from the, uh, you know, the window of the uh, frat house. There's a lot of criticism of McElwain right now and his leadership of the program as well. 
I mean, three and three is obviously what it is, but it's two consecutive SEC East there as well. It's kind of a weird mixed bag for Florida. I expect we might get some of this by the end of the season. Maybe it's happening a little sooner even than I thought it would. What do you make about the uh, growing criticism, the sort of the swirling uh, disappointment that seems to exist around the Florida program at the moment? Yeah, it's tough for me. You know, I kind of sit on the fence right now when I really think about Jim McElwain's job security because, you know, I've kind of been in his corner when you talk about some of the issues they have. I mean, you know, they have 85 scholarships, and honestly, they're playing with about 70 of them right now. When yeah. you talk about all the suspensions they've had and the injuries and, and some of their better players, obviously. But then you also look at the, some of the things you think Jim McElwain should be able to be good at. I mean, right now they have, uh, you know, all the quarterbacks he's recruited other than Luke Del Rio kind of leaving the, you know, leaving the seed there. But the, the, the top two quarterbacks they went in with, uh, you know, against Michigan, they still have those guys on the roster. And I think it does beg the question to ask, hey, Jim McElwain, you were brought in here to develop an offense and a running game and a quarterback situation that was stable. And so far, you know, midway through year three, you haven't got that done. And so I understand where the questions kind of uh, come from. I think that – I mentioned this to you yesterday on the show. If I'm Jim McElwain, I think I have to separate myself from Doug Nussmeyer at some point, bring in somebody that can challenge my ideas offensively. They can say, you know what, I see what you're doing here, but this in the past we've done this differently and maybe this is a wrinkle we could throw in. Because I think Jim McElwain has the offensive line to be able to get it done down there in Florida. But right now he doesn't have the quarterback or the offensive line to be able to fit his style. And so – I think that at some point changes do have to come. You know, I, I, I think that's in the form of firing Doug Nussmeyer. But in a lot of ways, I understand uh, why Florida fans have started to get a little bit angry at what's going on down there. It just doesn't look like uh, you think it would under Jim McElwain in year three. By the way, if you want, Mike, a uh, sort of an idea of how Georgia fans feel going into this game, I thought Terrence Collins had a really funny line in our Facebook Live comment section a moment ago. He said he wants to beat Florida so bad on Saturday that Steve Spurrier goes bald. Like, if, if you want an idea <laughs> of how Georgia fans are feeling and the sort of insatiable hunger for some retribution, Terrence Collins' comment in our Facebook Live comment section is probably about the uh, perfect synopsis of the way Dog Nation feels at the moment. I, I, I don't blame them at all. Listen, I've, I've been in those shoes before. I'm telling you right now, we beat uh, Tommy Somerville and Auburn back in 08 for the first time in six years. And I had the same feeling before going into that Iron Bowl game. I thought, man, if, if we could beat him so bad that he's on the hot seat, then it would be a good day. And obviously we came out 36-0 and he was fired. <laughs> he was fired the next day. So <laughs> that's just uh, – I, I understand it, man. You, you, some of these games you line up in and you got blood in your eyes and you got slobber coming out of your mouth, especially the fans in the, uh, in the stands. And, uh, man, it's an emotional deal when you get into some of these games. Dennis Dodd at CBS Sports wrote a pretty interesting column. Kirby Smart was sort of the subject of it. He mentioned some other coaches as well. And this is actually something you and I have talked about before, although maybe you don't remember, um, about the breakthroughs that happened for certain coaches in year two. Nick Saban it was a, in Alabama. It was a SEC West in 2008. By you know 2009, you're winning national championships there. But the, the, the year two breakthrough is the spot that it happened. Same thing for a Bob Stoops at Oklahoma. Same thing for you know a, a Mark Richt at Georgia when the SEC SEC in his second year as a guy who kind of went through that metamorphosis and that transition with Saban from year one where it was not good you've been as open and honest about that as anybody uh could ever be to year two where it got way better would you mind reminding us one more time about exactly how that transition came about how did it change so quickly and does that give you any kind of light shed on maybe what Kirby Smart has done here over the course of uh two years or even less than two years at Georgia well, it definitely does, and I think that when you saw Nick Saban arrive on campus back in 2007, it, first of all, he had to recruit better players, and you and I have talked about that a couple of times. If you want to get to that championship level, you have to up your caliber of players, but he also had to weed out what we had in the system. Guys that didn't want to buy in, guys that thought they were going to show up and give 70 80% at practice and, and still be kind of the stars. I mean, we had guys that went on to NFL careers, and, 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 and that's the thing when you look back at 2007 in Alabama is, those guys might have been good players, but they weren't practicing with 100% of their injury, uh, with their energy, I'm sorry. And uh, Nick Saban would tell guys, he'd say, hey, look, I, I understand that you're the star of this program and you think you're great, but I promise you when I can replace you, I'm going to replace you. And he went out and recruited <laughs> better players. The class, so I, think, I mean, all of a sudden you look around, Dante Hightower's there, Julio Jones is there, Courtney Upshaw's there. I mean, you name it, these guys started showing up. Barrett Jones, I mean, it, it was one by one. You started seeing better players come in. And guess what? The guys that didn't want to give 100%, weren't on the field anymore. They weren't even welcome into the program. And so I, I think you see a little bit of that at Georgia and starting to come through in Kirby Smart where the players that are playing this year, specifically I see it in the offensive line, but the players that are playing this year have completely bought into what he is saying and what he is trying to get done. And I know that once we started being successful at Alabama, the first thing I used to say was, 
you know, we, we deserve the championship because we outworked everybody. And I, I know that's the, the mentality that Kirby Smart is instilling. It's, it, it, there's no shortcut. You go to work every day. You practice as hard as you possibly can. And when Saturday comes, uh, there's nothing new to you. And, and so I think that's the way this team has started to attack the season, and that's why it's been so special to watch this turnaround for them. I want to give you some credit for something as we get ready to wrap up here. A few weeks ago, you were already talking about something that starts to feel like a little bit bigger topic now, and that's the chance that the SEC could get two teams into the college football playoff, that the loser of the SEC championship game, if it's a one-loss team, Alabama or Georgia, for instance, that team may have a better resume than a – than another conference champion, a Notre Dame, someone that's kind of knocking on the door of that. You were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. I didn't really quite see that as a likely scenario, but, boy, Mike, that seems like a much more realistic conversation now with the first ranking set to come out uh, this upcoming Tuesday. Yeah, it's going to be interesting for sure. And, uh, you know, specifically when you look at Georgia and that win over Notre Dame that just seems week in and week out to be looking even better and better. I mean, that, that really looks like a huge win for them. And Notre Dame is going to have a, a possibility to sneak into that playoff themselves if they continue to win out. So I, I think the possibility is there. I think the dominoes have to fall in other conferences. I, for me right now, the Pac-12 is out. And, and you and I have talked about the Big 12, the fact that you know, listen, this is, a, this is a conference that added a championship game to try to help them get back yeah. to the college football playoff, and it might end up damaging this year. Yeah. When you look at that round-robin effect they're having in TCU and whoever it's going to be down the stretch having to play each other an extra time, uh, that could start to look bad. And so I think the possibility is definitely there. I, I, I mentioned it to you. If we saw the SEC championship game this year like we did back in 2012 between Alabama and Georgia, then I don't know how you keep Georgia out. I really don't. I, you know, I know there's going to be other scenarios where you're going to have one loss teams from other conferences and two loss teams from other conferences. But if you stack Georgia up, you know, if that game did play out in like 2012 and Georgia had lost to the number one team in the country in the championship game, then I think it's very, very tough to keep them out and not put them in as number four seed. Hey, Mike, great stuff. I look forward to seeing you today on at and SEC Country Live, 3 p.m. Eastern time, SEC Country Facebook page. We'll talk to you then. Can't wait, buddy. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Always enjoy having Mike Johnson here on uh, Dog Nation Daily. And if you've never checked us out on AT&T SEC Country Live, we're going to have a great show today, 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll talk a lot about Georgia, obviously a lot about the game against the Gators. And listen, I say this all the time, I, I need a lot of those dog fans in that comment section protecting me from these nasty, stinking Gators, man. They're always coming at me on that uh, comment section every day. So I need some folks in there helping me uh, defend myself against that group. And we'll do our some SEC talk here for SEC Through here in just a moment let me remind you before that though the dog nation daily is brought to you in part by our friends at my bookie you know my bookie the uh, sports book known for the fast no hassle payout when you win when you get make a bet let's face it you want to win and you want to get paid when you do win that's why you want to trust my bookie but right now it's not just the fast no hassle payout that's going to get you liking my bookie it's also the special offer they have for dog nation daily listeners and viewers if you go to their website mybookie.ag right now and you enter the promo code dog nation you can get your first deposit matched up to 100%, but you got to act right now. It's mybookie.ag. The promo code is Dog Nation, spelled the way that it's supposed to be spelled, with D-A-W-G. That's Dog Nation. Uh, you play, you win, you get paid, and your first deposit can be matched up to 100%. Mybookie.ag, promo code Dog Nation. Good luck, and uh, enjoy that payout when you uh, do become a winner there. All right, let me talk about some SEC stories for a moment. So uh, the ESPN college football writer Chris Lowe goes on a sports talk radio show out in Arkansas with Bo Manningly this week, and Lowe makes kind of an interesting statement. He thinks it's not an exaggeration to say that at the end of the season, you could have six SEC coaches out of a job, and conversely, six SEC programs looking for a new coach. Now, who is this six going to be? That's the first question I guess you'd ask here. Ole Miss is probably the easiest answer. They're probably going to do something different than Luke, the interim coach. Butch Jones would seem a foregone conclusion. Bielema would seem a foregone conclusion, but that just gets you to three. You start adding more names to that list, now you get to Barry Odom in uh, Missouri, which would anyone even notice if he got fired or not, but that gives you four. Now you start thinking about sort of weird names. Is there a, is, is there a, a, a Gus Malzahn on this list that gets you to six? Is Malzahn leaving of his own volition to go to a place like uh, Arkansas or your, that has been suggested and somewhere somewhere along those lines? Does, does uh, Dan Mullen leave Mississippi State, take the Tennessee job, and that becomes the sixth? Does Jim McElwain actually, either because of Florida growing tired of him, McElwain growing tired of Florida, difficult to say who's more tired of the other, does that kind of lead to uh, some turmoil? That number caught my attention. Six coaches being opening, 
And that may be a slight exaggeration, but it just goes to show you we could be heading for a wild offseason here in the uh, SEC. One coach that right, for right now would appear to have sort of settled things down and would not appear to be in jeopardy of losing his job at the end of the season is the first-year coach at LSU at Orgeron. But I thought my colleague at SECCountry.com, Alex Hickey, had a pretty interesting uh, take this week about, you know, what would have happened had LSU not lost the game to Troy earlier in the year? And Hickey's point, and this is kind of an interesting one, although I don't necessarily agree with it, what Hickey says is, hey, if you don't lose to Troy, maybe you don't get the focus and intensity that led to wins against Florida and uh, a, a win against Auburn. Maybe the good LSU you're seeing now doesn't happen at the team not lost to Troy. I'm not quite sure I buy that. I mean, it may be true. I'm just not sure it can be proven true. I think what's maybe more true or easily more easily proven is that had LSU beaten Troy, all of a sudden there's a very different conversation happening around the Tigers right now. This is looking like one of those one-loss teams that's kind of in the mix for a potential playoff discussion, and maybe LSU's given a little bit more credit as a team that has a shot to beat Alabama coming up in two weeks. Now, I don't think LSU's going to beat Alabama, and I actually think LSU's got more bad games coming by the end of the season. But it is sort of interesting to think how the perception of the Troy loss impacts a team that's actually looked pretty good here as of late. Uh, by the way, you know, along those same lines, the, the the question comes up about you know Auburn in the same discussion. You know, I, I thought that uh, uh, Marcus Spears on one of those SEC Network shows. We'll play some audio for you on this today on AT and T SEC Country Live. Auburn, even though it lost to LSU, is kind of in the same boat as LSU. They're both two lost teams, and they're both you know trying to figure out how alive they still are to kind of get you know back into the thick of the SEC West race and get to Atlanta, maybe be a two-loss team in the conversation for the college football playoff. What Spears said on the SEC Network this week is is that he still thinks Auburn is capable of doing that. I think Auburn's a good team. I think it's capable of beating either Alabama or Georgia. I don't think it's capable of being both those teams right now, but I do think Georgia fans should remember that uh, Auburn is still a tough opponent for the Dogs at the end of the season. We'll go ahead and make that your SEC through and get ready to say hello here to our buddy David Green, the former Georgia quarterback. Uh, of course, uh, he's always a part of those uh, great events taking place at Tailgate Apparel, uh, 279 East Broad Street in the old Harry Bissett's building before every Georgia home game. And, of course, he's a great guy to talk to with the cocktail party looming on Saturday. David, thanks for your time here today. Welcome back to Dog Nation Daily. How you doing today? Doing good, Brandon. How about yourself, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing really well. I'm obviously getting really excited about the game on uh, Saturday against Florida. I'm sure you feel much the same way. And I guess I'm curious to you as a guy that – not only played at Georgia, but has followed the program ever since you left, and a guy that really probably grew up around the uh, history of Georgia football also. What does the Florida rivalry mean to you? Well, you know, when I got there in 2000, um, it was clearly a game that we were just licking our chops to try to kind of break the curse um, at the time because, you know, Georgia had not had a whole lot of success. And I remember, you know, being on those teams wanting so bad to just win that game um, and kind of break that curse and get that monkey off our back. Now, of course, it didn't happen to my senior year. I'm certainly glad we finally beat them. But, you know, it's one of those games at times, you know, Brandon, we we just wanted it so bad. And I think sometimes when you want it so bad, you end up not relaxing and playing your own game, uh, and you end up, um, you know, making it more than what it is. You know, but having said that, Brandon, that worried me quite as much about this team because I actually feel like the culture of this team is a little bit different where – they're not quite as much of a, a yo-yo <laughs> as some of the teams that I was on and even some of the teams through the Coach Rick era. Uh, it, they've played pretty steady football, kind of regardless if it was a cupcake game or if it was, a, you know, we're, we're playing Notre Dame or Tennessee or somebody like that. So I think this team has a pretty good mindset that, you know, we're going to play a certain brand of football uh, regardless of who we're playing or regardless of what the score is. Yeah, I think the same thing is true for another subject we've talked about a lot on this show this week, which is some trash talk that comes from Florida, whether it be Chauncey Gardner, uh, you know, Hammond the wide receiver, talking about, you know, the fact that they don't think Georgia can beat Florida and Florida's dominated the series. And, you know, for some teams and, you know, some eras, whether it be Georgia or somebody else, you may think that kind of trash talk would kind of get the team off its balance, off its axis. But as you said, for this Georgia team, it seems like there's a lot less likelihood of something like that having a negative impact on the team. They'll either ignore it or use it as motivation, but they won't be hurt by it. At least that's the impression I've gotten. Would you agree? No, I think there's no question. I think that kind of talk is uh, is irrelevant. I think if anything, it's um, you know it's kind of a sign of disrespect 
and normally when uh, you know a team takes you for granted or you know, you know don't think enough of you that's normally when you sneak up and uh, and you get them plus you know look I mean if, if I were on Florida's team and if this was Georgia the one talking trash and we've lost three games and and Florida was undefeated <laughs> I would be telling my teammates go what are you doing you know it it kind of brand has that feel uh, like when you're down by three touchdowns and you score a touchdown and you spike the ball and get an unsportsmanlike, <laughs> it's when you want to look at your player and be like, dude, look at the big picture here. Yeah. Just shut up and play the game. Uh, but that, you know, to me, it it kind of shows a little bit of, in my opinion, lack of uh, lack of leadership as well, what's going on in Florida right now. I mean, I couldn't imagine being the coach down there and letting that kind of stuff um, – take place as well so it's all part of it, it, it we're, we're sitting in a good spot and at the end of the day uh when you go out there and you play the game you just gotta go up there and and uh and play the game and make it happen speaking of leadership you know you you'd like what you see from georgia you kind of described that a moment ago i mean how much do you think guys like nick chubb sony michelle the guys that could have gone to the nfl but came back for final season you'll add you know davin bellamy lorenzo carter into that you may even talk about like dominic sanders aaron davis guys like that also how much do those seniors contribute to the culture that you describe uh, so favorably for Georgia right now? Well, I think it's huge. And, and you hear it when you, when you hear them talk during a week. And, you know, one thing is players, you know, we typically hate practice. I mean, we love playing in games, but you hate practice. And one thing Kirby has been able to, to bring to the table is, is realizing these guys, every time we line up, regardless if it's practice or a game, there's a certain way and a certain intensity we gotta we got to play to get better. And, and you can tell that the guys have bought into that because uh, you hear some of our leaders, Lorenzo Carter and guys talking about, uh, we want to win, we got to win this game during a week. And that's not something you typically hear from kids in college. <laughs> yeah. That's normally like what you hear from a head coach uh, and the pros. And so you can tell that these guys are buying into – Let's just get better. Let, let, forget about the score. Forget about the opponent. Forget who we're playing. Let's just figure out how we can get better as a team and get better individually. And, and honestly, if you can do those things, then um, you know, really the sky's the limit. So obviously when Georgia fans think about the series against Florida, one of the great memories that comes to mind is the 1980 game, Lindsey Scott, his touchdown run. I understand next week, uh, tailgate apparel before the game against South Carolina. Dog fans actually have a chance to meet Lindsey Scott there at tailgate apparel and see the cool stuff that's inside the store there at tailgate apparel. But what a great autograph opportunity that is to uh, talk and, and get, get, a, get a signature from the guy who really contributed one of the great moments in Georgia football history. There's no question. Lindsey, uh, he's a legend. You know, it's fun just being around some of the guys that are on that 1980 team and hearing them talk about Lindsey and uh, what he meant to that team and how competitive he was and uh, certainly made some unbelievable plays. And, and look, when you're undefeated uh, and you're in games like that where you got somebody's got to step up and make that play, uh, it's pretty awesome. You know, a guy like Lindsey was able to step up in such a crucial moment in, in a Georgia-Florida game like that. And, um and help bring the team a victory. So, no, you're right. He'll be at Tailgate, uh, tailgate uh, Apparel Store next week. We don't have the time set yet. I know it's a, they just announced it's a 3.30 kickoff. My guess it'll probably be somewhere around noon, but we'll uh, nice. we'll have those details for sure next week. 279 East Broad Street's the old Harry Bissett's building. It's a uh, great spot right there in downtown Atlanta. I love the tailgate uh, apparel stuff. I like the old, cool, retro UGA stuff. They get a lot of that there. And Lindsey Scott next Saturday before the game against the Gamecocks. A really nice 3.30 time slot. David, enjoy the cocktail party this week against the Gators. We'll hopefully talk to you before the South Carolina game next week. And uh, just thanks for your time here on Dog Nation Daily. Sounds good, Brandon. Thank you, buddy. Always fun to have David Green here on uh, Dog Nation Daily. And speaking of fun, when you think ahead to our Dog Nation invasion tailgate in Jacksonville on Saturday in the subsequent game against Florida, well, the one thing you want to hear is some good news about the weather. Now, early in the week, I guess, it had been kind of a bad forecast. You know how it is with the Florida coast and Jacksonville, certainly near the Florida coast. Uh, things can change pretty quickly. But I was checking the weather before today's show, and for now, it actually looks okay. I've got a high of 83 on Saturday, just a 20% chance of rain. This after essentially like 80, 100% chance of rain showing for Saturday when you looked at the weather forecast yesterday. So things are kind of moving in the direction of where uh, Georgia fans want it to with the weather. Hopefully uh, the action still uh, is on the field exactly what Georgia fans hope it will be. My guess is it probably will be. However, no matter what the weather's like, it's kind of nice to know that Georgia's getting prepared either way. You heard the stories about Georgia practicing with the wet footballs yesterday. 
Just shows you the focus and determination of Kirby Smart right now. Nice to see, and we'll see you tomorrow right here on Dog Nation Daily. For those of you that want to comment on video right now, we'll give you a chance to do all of that. Appreciate you being here. And um, uh, really good stuff, I thought, from uh, both Green and uh, Mike Johnson. You heard the passion in David's voice talking about some of the stuff we've seen from Florida this week. I mean, it just sort of speaks to why this is such a big rivalry and why Georgia fans are so hungry to kind of go out there and see that thing turn into a win uh, this week. Really good stuff. Let me dive into some comments here. <laughs> Wayne Follin says... <laughs> 100% forecast for no T-shirts for Facebook viewers. So, Wayne, we are going to do that eventually. The problem is, is I'm just disorganized, to be completely honest with you, but we are going to start giving away T-shirts to Facebook uh, viewers here pretty soon. That's my fault for not doing that. But, Wayne, you are absolutely doing the right thing by holding my feet to the fire. Y'all know I'm kind of a mess sometimes. you got to kind of stay on me about stuff like that. Um, Nakia Hester says, how many times will Georgia run the wild dog on Saturday? So for me, you know, Nakia, the wild dog has sort of always felt like um, more of a thing that you do in a game in which you don't think you can block the defensive line. Now, I've got respect for those Florida, you know, defenders up front. That's the one area in which McElwain's kind of hit on some recruits. But, you know, you look at the size advantage that Georgia ought to have over those guys up front for Florida, this ought to be able to, uh, to be a group that Georgia can push around a little bit. I don't mean from the word go, but I mean eventually – the Georgia size up front can eventually wear down the Florida size up front. I'm not saying you don't see Wild Dog at all in the game, but this is not one of those deals where I think Georgia feels like it's got to resort to stuff like that to run the football. I think it probably feels like it can run the football in uh, traditional ways. Alan Verbonchik says, the scary part is that UGA is nowhere near where they will eventually be with all the recruits here now and those coming in the future. And Alan's right about that. As much fun as we're all having with the 2017 season right now, this team, for the moment, is actually kind of ahead of schedule. I mean, right now, as I've said before, and during this portion of the show, we can kind of be candid with each other. This is still a, uh, a team that's got some weaknesses at some position groups. This is not necessarily a, a national championship level, level wide receiver core, for instance. It's not a national championship secondary in my mind. Uh, you've still got some, you know, some other issues that you might want to, want to point out, but, but specifically at the secondary and the wide receiver core, you're not talking about the, you know, the the same level that you typically see from a national champion. But by 2019, all that stuff's over. 2019, George's bringing in the what top two receivers in the country, Dominic Blaylock and Jaden Hazelwood, and who knows what happens in the class of 2018, going out and getting a, I mean, potentially here, I'm not making any promises, but a, a five-star cornerback like Tyson Campbell. All of a sudden, what looks like areas in which George is not a perfect roster right now, by 2019, those holes have been closed up. And... I forgot when Jeff said this. Was it um, on our show this week? Was it last night at Marlowe's? Was it off the air? I can't even remember. But he said something the other, other day that sort of stopped me in my tracks. You know, the people that don't follow recruiting as closely as many of you do would sort of look at George's future and say, oh, by 2018, this is the uh, deepest The deepest position group is going to be running back. Or you might say, uh, assuming that Jacob Eason stays, the deepest position group is going to be quarterback. But Jeff's was saying the other day that between the guys that Georgia is getting and the guys that Georgia might be getting, both the class of 2018-2019, that actually outside linebacker, the group of folks who sack quarterbacks, that may actually end up being a deeper position group than running back or quarterback. Let that set in for a moment, that you'd actually have competition for which position group is deepest with five-star type talent. As Allen said, 2018-2019, this team is only getting better, at least in terms of roster strength. Now, the individual games obviously it will always be difficult to predict but what's not difficult to predict is that the overall level of talent percentage of four and five star players uh however you want to measure it that's going up 2018 better than 2017 2019 even better than that good point alan scott barman i, I forgot he told us this one time before that he was a red coat in 1980 what a party that must have been he says it was i i, I can only imagine what that must have been like i love watching those old Georgia games in ESPN Classic. One of the things I'm always fascinated by is, and they never do enough crowd shots for me. It's actually the crowd shots in the old Georgia games. Like sometimes they'll show the 76 Sugar Bowl on ESPN Classic, the one between uh, Pitt and uh, Georgia. Obviously the 80 Georgia-Florida game comes up a lot. It's always funny. You know, I was alive in 1980, but when you see photographs of the uh, Georgia-Florida 1980 uh, game, the photos are all in, like, black and white. It makes it seem like it's a 1,000 years ago, like it's something that happened like Babe Ruth's era. It's so funny how old that seems now. And, you know, I was, I was alive and kicking. I was, I, I was three in 1980, but I was still alive. 
but those pictures make it seem like such a long time ago. But the, the point I'm trying to make, though, here is is that I love seeing in the stands to kind of see how Georgia fans have kind of changed over the years. You know, the 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 songs the band played are a little bit different. The, the way the fans dress is a little bit different. I mean, there is these sort of evolutions of tradition over time, and it's just kind of funny to kind of watch that when you see these games in the ESPN Classic. I would have loved to have, if I could ever time travel, go back to one of those Georgia games from that era, that would be a, a really fun thing to do. Steve Jeffrey says, dude, I'm 70. Let's win the national championship this year. Steve says he's waited long enough. I think a lot of Georgia fans would probably agree. Nakia Hester says 230 passing yards for Fromm on Saturday. I'd take that in a heartbeat. That'd be nice to see. Um, Sean Doyle says Florida says they can shut the run game down. They haven't uh, faced DeAndre Swift. I mean, listen, Florida is almost like a LeVar Ball type thing. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, that's what Florida really is. They, they're the LeVar Ball of the SEC. Well, and y- y'all know who LeVar Ball is, um, or at least a, l- a lot of you probably do. You know, he's going to say he can beat Michael Jordan one-on-one. He's going to say his son, you know, is better at basketball than LeBron James. He's going to kind of say whatever, but there's no connection to fact. Florida says it can shut down Georgia's running game. I'm not surprised that they said that. <laughs> and, and people say, well, that, they haven't seen DeAndre Swift. I don't think they care. I, I, don't, I don't think they say it because they actually believe it or say it because they have anything to back it up. I just think they like saying it. So, yeah, I mean, Georgia's got a host of running backs, way better than anything that Florida sees during practice. But, you know, Florida just sort of likes to hear itself talk with stuff like this. Uh, I mean, they are very LeVar Ball-like in that way. Tim Bowman says Trent Thompson's going to be the player of the game. That's that's a pretty good call. I know he's looking forward to being back on that field. Uh, Winford Steinspring checking in from Jacksonville already. Beautiful morning. RV City Open yesterday. Loved hearing that. Already a lot of stuff going on. He says bring those Gator Hitter t-shirts. We'll have them for you there. We'll be bringing them with you. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, let me scroll down. Boy, these are coming in fast. I'm missing a couple. Uh, Santiago Diarn says, uh, how would you assess the play calling by Jim Chaney? Is it really simple and uh, dumbed down? I finally jumped on the Chaney bandwagon. Fromm simply makes plays. So one of the reasons why I think you're seeing a better version of Jim Chaney this year is because you're seeing a better version of the offensive line. And I don't play the see I told you so game on this show a lot because I'm wrong too much to do that too often, just to be completely frank. But I did tell you all this, that if the offensive line were to play better, that Chaney would probably, his play calling might make a little bit more sense. Even in the game this year where the fans had the most trouble with Chaney, the Notre Dame game, if you look at that, that's one of the games in which the Georgia offensive line also struggled the most. But since then, the offensive line has gotten gotten better, particularly in the interior. Lamont Gilliard has sort of settled in and become a pretty good center. Uh, Solomon Kenley, when healthy, is not getting pushed around by anybody, and I would say that Kendall Baker's probably had a pretty good year as well, which is to say nothing of Isaiah Wynn, who's not the perfect left tackle, but he's certainly holding his own, and Andrew Thomas is just a future star, as simple as that. So this offensive line has gotten better, and all of a sudden Chaney's play calls just make a lot more sense. That, to me, is is what it is. I never thought Chaney was a bad offensive uh, coordinator. I thought he had a bad year last year, and I thought he had pressure on him to do better, but right now he is, and I just think he's dealing with better overall talent. Remember, the statistical performance for Chaney last year was actually worse than any other year in his career, and that shouldn't make any sense given the fact that Chaney had more talent last year than any other team he'd ever coached. So what you're seeing now is more kind of a regression to the mean of where you'd expect the Georgia offense to be. Better offensive line, quarterback who can handle whatever Chaney wants to give him, and all of a sudden he looks like a better play caller. I'm not telling you that Chaney's the best offensive mind in the sport, but he's getting the job done for Georgia for sure. Uh, Let me hit a few more here. Wayne Folan says Fromm gives Chaney more options than Eason. Unfortunately, that may be true, and I, I don't, you know, relish ever, you know, comparing one player to another in a negative light. But I do think I do think that Fromm is is. Well, let me say it this way: I think Fromm has few limitations for a freshman quarterback. I, I, I really do. Dalton Scott says Cheney needs Pittman to be successful, plain and simple. And uh, right now, that's kind of the relationship you see going on there, Dalton. I think that's a good point. Peggy Adler has a great comment. She says, when I was young, we had a bulldog dress for home games, and my dad always brought huge uh, corsages. Uh, That's awesome. Don't you love hearing that, getting dressed up in the dress, putting the corsage on before the game? Peggy, thanks for sharing that. That's that's a really cool era to think about. You still see a lot of folks dressed up. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing to see, and it's very, very different uh, 
in the South compared to the uh, rest of college football. Go to South Bend, for instance. Nicest fans in the world, but they're wearing like what I'm wearing right now, blue jeans and a T-shirt. You know, they're not dressing up for those games. You see, you know, uh, alumni, students, they're getting pretty dressed up on a uh, Saturday uh, even still, and that's kind of a cool thing to do. Jerry Lewis says, what happens after Saturday with the uh, Dog Nation Daily uh, Gatorator Countdown? Jerry, uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll, whatever decision comes on that will come after some good news. I may punt on that at least for the moment. Alan Verbonchik says it's his birthday today. Alan, thanks for checking in. Appreciate that. On your birthday. Thanks for spending it with us. Michael uh, Ruban Jr. says, will we finally see more screens against Florida? We have used the bubble screen a lot, but would love to see one with Michelle or Swift to the outside. That might be an interesting thing to see. I actually thought that um, uh, LSU was kind of doing something kind of cool with that the other day with uh, Daryl Williams, one of their running backs, where you put you put uh, um, Geis in the game, make him kind of a decoy up the middle, and then they're throwing like the little screen to the uh, running back, almost like a wheel route, but it but it still you know works you know the the same as the screen. And it was it was just really hard to defend because you got to have linebackers key the middle of the field against the running game, and you know this. You know, backup running backs getting his uh, 10, 12 yards a catch on the a little bubble screen, you know, uh, on the or not a bubble screen, but more of like a little wheel route screen on the uh, outside. You know, could Georgia do something like that? We've seen them have two running backs on the field a little bit. And, you know, uh, maybe that's something that, that uh, Georgia can utilize. I, I think it was the first quarter against Mississippi State where you saw both Chubb and Swift in the game at the same time. And it's the fake handoff to Chubb up the middle, and it's the sort of the speed sweep to uh, to Swift on the outside, and that's a very, very tough thing for a opposing defense to uh, deal with. James Crump says, Fromm was ready from playing in the Georgia high school system. Fields will make Cheney look like a great offensive coordinator, uh, a great head coaching candidate. Yeah, when, when you have these quarterbacks that played in Georgia against tough competition, and normally, you know, you don't think of, you know, Cobb County as being the toughest competition in the state of Georgia, but it's gotten much better over the years. And Harrison certainly plays a uh, tough enough schedule against Rome and Dalton and teams like that, that, that you're seeing, you know, fields get tested. You saw Fromm get tested. Uh, you know, you're, you're seeing those quarterbacks, um, you know, come to the college level ready to play and prepared to handle what a guy like Cheney wants to give him. I do think that fields would probably be a lot like Fromm in that regard. Neil Landon Jackson checking in from very near the Georgia-Florida line. I mean, you know, geographically, a lot of y'all on this show, you know, you had uh, Winford earlier in Jacksonville, a lot of folks who watch us from Fernandina Beach, uh, which y'all know I love down there at Millie Island. Uh, right there at the Georgia-Florida line is uh, Neil. Uh, you got a lot of folks geographically very close to Jacksonville, and, and that makes that Georgia-Florida game all the more special for them. Darian Daniel says, could you see Fromm and Fields on the field at the same time? You know, as a as a gimmick maybe, just to give somebody else something to think about, I, I wouldn't put it past Kirby Smart or Jim Chaney. That's kind of a funny thing to think about. Sean Doyle asking about Akil Crumpton. When's he going to break out? Hoping he'd be the next Isaiah McKenzie. I, I think Akil's issue is twofold. A, the kick return duties have been handled pretty pretty well this year by, you know, guys like McCole Harbin, Terry Godwin. And then the uh, whole host of guys doing the uh, kickoff stuff. You've seen, you know, a handful of different guys kind of doing that. And, you know, McCole Hardman as a receiver has kind of occupied that slot receiver role. There hasn't been a lot of opportunities for other catches for a team that's choosing to be efficient with its passing game. Throwing and trying to compile big numbers when it does throw, but but not throwing a whole bunch. I don't know if, if there's any other explanation for Akil Crumpton's absence any more than that. He was brought here as an insurance policy. This was the best, biggest school he was going to have a chance to go to. And because uh, if it hadn't been this, I think he was going to go, what, to like Iowa State or somewhere like that? Or I, I, it was a school of that caliber. It may not have been Iowa State, but it was not a big school that he was going to go to. He may have looked at this and said, hey, you know, I'll come here be an insurance policy. As it turns out, it's not an insurance policy that Georgia has needed. But Crumpton may be having a good time just being on a bigger school and a part of a uh, bigger pursuit than he otherwise would have been somewhere else. Trey Harvey checking in down in Camden County there in Kingsland. Uh, first of all, a hotbed for high school football and a spot where you know there are a bunch of Gator haters. There's no question about that. Uh, great place to be. and appreciate you checking in. Justin um, and Michelle McGee also down there in Nassau County. Listen, I love Amelia Island, and i uh, uh, love to have you check in there from uh, Nassau County. Demetra Smith also checking in, too. I appreciate that. We're getting ready to wrap up here in a uh, couple of minutes. Nikia Hester says if Hardman breaks free in a punt return, he's gone. Yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys that's so close every single time, so close to just really breaking a long one. And at some point in time, that's going to happen. 
Terrence Collins says he's stationed in Valdosta, but but from the 912. Uh, Terrence, we appreciate your service. Thank you so much for also watching us here today on uh, Dog Nation Daily. And I just lost our uh, comments. I Sometimes with the, when the uh, comments scroll and I try to click a like, I end up messing myself up. Let me see if I can get back in here. It's almost time for us to well, check off here today. But uh, sometimes I accidentally click out of the comments, and I just did that a, a moment ago. So I'll get back in and get ready to say goodbye. Uh, I will tell you while we're um, – uh, getting ready to wrap up here. we got a fun show coming up for you the rest of the week. Uh, Brad Nessler going to be with us tomorrow. He's got the game on CBS. We'll talk to uh, Brad about the uh, CBS call, what he expects from the cocktail party. Seth Emerson, of course, as always. Jeff Sintel going to be here on Friday. Then he and I going to get into a vehicle and head on down to Jacksonville. Hope to see many of you there. Uh, let me take a couple quick comments before we get out of here. Uh, Melchizedek Lockwood says, B.A., what's your favorite nickname for the Gators? Listen, I know some of y'all have some that I can't say on the air here. Uh, Diedrich Frazier says right now Georgia uh, has got that quiet confidence. You know, I, th- I think Diedrich brings a really good point when he says that. Uh, Travis Griffin says true test for the defense to shut them down in the scoring streak. Boy, a lot of folks have been talking about that. Florida, I guess, hasn't been shut out in the game since 1994. A lot of dog fans like to see that happen on Saturday. Me, I'm going to try not to be greedy and just be okay with a win, but I understand where that comes from. A lot of y'all want that. If I did not get to your comment today, I apologize that I missed it. You can hit me up on Twitter, at Dog Nation Daily. If you've got something for the Gator Hater Roll Call, you can also hit me up there as well. Um, see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. for Dog Nation Daily Live. I'll be back today at 3 p.m. Eastern time on the SEC Country Facebook page for AT&T SEC Country Live. It's going to be a fun week. It rolls on here this afternoon and tomorrow. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you tomorrow again at 10 a.m.